Jarvis chapter 20 focuses on the peripheral vascular system and the lymphatic drainage system. When you're reviewing the material, remember that you should know normal and abnormal findings. Try to be very organized in your approach. Obtain your subjective data first, followed by your objective data. Analyze and interpret your findings to create a priority plan of care. The focus of this chapter is circulation, perfusion, and drainage. You should know how to inspect the extremities, identifying normal versus abnormal skin color, hair distribution, nail growth, and edema, palpate pulses in the radial, popliteal, femoral, and pedal regions, and oscillate with a Doppler if you cannot palpate. In your book, review the anatomy and physiology for the vascular system and the lymphatics, focusing on how they are connected and um, how these two systems really are interrelated in terms of fluid balance and uh, circulation control. Review the structure and function of the arteries. So we know that in the peripheral circulation, the arterial blood is oxygenated and being pumped uh, from the left ventricle to the body's tissues. Each heartbeat creates a pressure wave which makes the arteries expand and then they recoil. They have a nice thick muscular structure. And the function of the arteries is to supply oxygen and essential nutrients to the capillary beds which then perfuse the tissues. The arteries in the arm include the brachial, ulnar, and radial arteries. Um, you should recognize that there's also um, arterial arches in the palm region and um, know how to palpate the uh, radial pulse and even the ulnar pulse. In the legs, both the arterial and venous structures are significant. The femoral, popliteal, tibial arteries, dorsalis pedis, and plantar arteries um, are uh, significant landmarks in terms of pop, uh, palpating pulses. Uh, we're going to talk about peripheral arterial disease. And then the veins, the saphenous venous system is uh, probably the most important to us. If you do have to cannulate a vessel in the lower extremity, it's usually one of the saphenous veins. Varicose veins also um, are more prominent usually in lower extremities from intra-abdominal pressure and prolonged standing, and that leads to uh, engorgement and dilation of the venous structures, which um, when damaged can bleed like an artery. And then we're going to look at some peripheral venous disease. So just understand kind of the location and the structure and function of vessels in the extremities. The lymphatic ducts and drainage, you should know kind of the overall location um, and the functions. So they help um, kind of recollect, filter, and return fluid and plasma that has leaked out of the capillaries back into the venous system. They're also a huge part of the immune system, so they uh, filter out the pathogens that are in the interstitial spaces to prevent them from entering the vascular space and damaging critical organs like the heart. Um, and they also absorb liquids from the intestinal tract. The spleen, tonsils, and thymus are all part of the uh, lymphatic and immune system. The venous system um, from the legs has what we call a calf pump or a peripheral heart where um, the function of inspiration uh, which changes thoracic and intra-abdominal pressure and walking which um, changes skeletal muscle pressure on the vessels and then a system of um, valves within the lumen of the vessel help promote adequate blood flow back to the heart. And again, when you have uh, varicose veins, you lose the, um, the integrity of the valves within the veins and you lose the compression of the, the vessels um, and you start to get you know, pooling and, and edema 
uh, oftentimes with varicosities. So veins are called capitance vessels because of their ability to stretch, but a healthy vessel will contract again. So moving on to assessment, um, as always, you're going to collect your subjective data first and then inspect. And we're looking at the limbs for color, size, any trophic skin changes or lesions, including the nails, palpate the pulses, um, check for uh, nodes, and then um, think about the temperature, um, the color and condition of the skin, but uh, the condition. So how um, is it uh, diaphoretic, moist, dry? Check capillary refill, um, and then you can do measurements like leg circumference, edema grading, or ankle break ankle brachial index, uh, and then oscillate for brewies. So you can oscillate a brewy um, really over any vessel. Uh, you can do abdominal, you can do femoral, you can do uh, the carotid, which we've already talked about. So you'd use the bell of your stethoscope. So um, I'm going to go kind of uh, head to toe on this because you're kind of going to do everything at the same time. You wouldn't like in Inspect all of the extremities and then go back and then palpate all of the extremities and you know uh, so you're going to kind of do one region at a time so you're going to start off looking at the um, upper extremities uh, just looking at the skin looking for any changes in uh, color the temperature the condition um, palpating your pulses and checking the nail beds for capillary refill when you're checking the nail beds, you also want to assess for clubbing, which is a sign of chronic hypoxia. So I've included a picture of clubbing here, of both the fingernails and the toenails. Um, it is possible to have toenail clubbing simply from peripheral arterial disease in the lower extremities. So um, something that would be completely noteworthy would be a patient who had normal fingernails and clubbed toenails, because that tells us that they have lower extremity extremity arterial disease but somebody who has clubbing in both fingernails and toenails that tells us that they probably have um, either a um, lung or a heart disease that has led to a chronic uh, systemic hypoxia back up onto the um, arm if we're going to do an arterial uh, line we first of all perform what we call an uh, Allen test or modified Allen test where you compress both the radial and ulnar arteries. The thought behind this is that you're sticking uh, an, a catheter into the radial artery which is going to obstruct flow and so there has to be adequate flow from the um, ulnar artery. So you want to occlude the radial artery um, and the ulnar artery, have the person make a fist, um, have them relax their hand, keeping the, um, the radial artery compressed, you release the ulnar artery and you um, allow the or observe for normal return of circulation. Um, in this picture, you can just see how this person still has the ulnar artery compressed and um, there's obviously some sort of disease here where the person doesn't have adequate flow uh, from one side to the other. So that would be a concern. So if you compress one, if you compress both arteries, the hand should obviously be pale. If you only compress one of those arteries, there should be normal circulation to the entire hand. Moving down, you're going to assess the um, femoral area. So locate the femoral arteries, which is just below the inguinal ligament, um, halfway between the pubis and the anterior superior iliac spine. You can have the person kind of frog their leg or rotate the knee um, laterally to help open up that area, especially if they're obese. Um, so start off by using the pads of your fingers press firmly and then slowly release. Um, so you're going to feel the femoral pulse as you start to release. Um, if it's weak or diminished, then you can oscillate over the pulsation for a brewy. Palpating femoral pulses 
oftentimes takes practice to locate the correct landmarks. Typically, people try to palpate too far down into the groin or the leg. It's um, up higher than some people expect. Then you want to move down, and again, you're still doing your skin uh, inspection, but palpating the popliteal pulse. Um, so you'd be looking at the skin, temperature, color, condition, um, observing for any uh, edema, and then um, have the person um, extend their leg, but it should be relaxed enough that the knee is just slightly flexed. Uh, anchor the thumbs on the knees, curl the fingers around into the popliteal fossa, and um, just kind of cup inwards and feel um, for the, um, the popliteal pulse. Uh, so you want to be on the lower edge of the femur, the upper edge of the tibia. Um, it might be kind of uh, a lateral, more lateral than medial. Um, if uh, the person is prone, you can use, um, in this picture they have their thumbs. I don't recommend using your thumb to palpate a pulse, typically because you can actually feel your own pulse in your thumb. Um, but if the person is prone, then you can just approach from um, the posterior, I just use the pads of my fingers. On the foot, you should palpate the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial. The dorsalis pedis is the most common uh, pedal pulse that we palpate, and this is um, a very light palpation. It's usually between the uh, great toe and the second toe. Um, and you can see in this picture, kind of the red line on the foot is usually where you can palpate the pulse. Um, also note, you know, the color and temperature of the foot and any color changes of the skin while you're there. And then moving um, medially and upward, you want to check for the posterior tibial pulse just behind the medial malleolus. So we have that here. Uh, so curve your fingers around behind it, and um, it should be in the groove between the uh, medial malleolus and the Achilles tendon. Again, if you can't palpate these, look for other signs of adequate perfusion, such as normal color, normal temperature, good cap refill, and then um, confirm adequate flow with a Doppler. So to use a Doppler, you want to um, uh, basically put the, the person in the position of comfort so that you have um, adequate access to the site. Uh, the Doppler itself is just like an ultrasound machine, um, so it requires the uh, transducer. There's different tips that you can use, and then the coupling gel. Um, the coupling gel is going to be cold, so make sure that you tell the person that before you put it on them. Um, make sure you clean the machine first as well and bring something in to clean the skin off of the patient afterwards. Um, so you put the coupling gel on the end of the transducer or directly onto the spot, and then you place the transducer over the pulse site. Um, and it should be at about a 90 degree angle, but then you kind of just move it around a little bit um, and you should hear a swishing or whooshing sound, uh, very similar to what you would uh, hear if you were um, oscillating a brewery. You can also check for edema while you're on the extremities. Now, noting that edema can occur anywhere in the body. Fluid follows gravity, so if the person's been supine, the edema might be sacral or posterior. But if they've been sitting up, um, it's going to become dependent edema. Non-pitting edema is more indicative of something like thyroid dysfunction. Um, pitting edema, though, you de depress uh, for about five seconds and then release. Your finger should leave no indentation would be normal. Um, if the person has been standing all day or during pregnancy, they may have a little bit of um, like, you know, a sock line or something like that. But uh, to grade pitting edema, first of all, you want to know where it is and how high it goes and then how deep it pits. So um, this person, you know, has a four plus pitting edema to the mid calf or something like that. So you want to give it um, a location and, and a degree. Um, so we typically say that two millimeters of indentation is mild, which would be one plus. Four millimeters is moderate, which would be a two plus. Six millimeters is deep, which would be a three plus. 
and um, eight millimeters is uh, very deep, which is a four plus. So when you're looking at the feet, uh, one of the common things that we deal with in nursing, especially on the floors and in long-term care, is skin breakdown or ulceration. Um, this is important that you can differentiate between the types of ulcers because they have different underlying um, causes and then different cures. So let's start with venous. Um, venous ulcers are due to poor flow out of the leg, so poor blood return, which then leads to third spacing, buildup of toxins within the tissues. Um, it can cause uh, blood clots, um, and uh, usually there's a breakdown of um, uh, red blood cells in the area, which leaves an iron deposit, which is called um, hemosiderosis, which is uh, basically that dark staining, um, like brownish reddish color that you see on the legs. The skin becomes thickened and fibrotic, um, and it can also become very itchy. Um, cap refill is normal because there's normal arterial flow. So um, cap refill is a measurement of perfusion, not of um, extraction. So cap refill is normal. So these typically are found on the lower calf or the medial malleolus. Um, they're shallow. Uh, they have a lot of exudate because of the edema in the legs. They tend to be very wet wounds and weepy. Um, there's usually a lot of slough and there's granulation tissue. Again, there's adequate perfusion to the wound, um, but the problem is there's too much fluid hanging out in the area. So we want to do compression leg elevation and sometimes surgical debridement as well. Um, but the goal is to reduce the edema so that we can get rid of some of the toxins and allow the wound to heal. So the goal is to kind of um, normalize it, so dry it out a little bit, not too dry, but normalize it and compress the um, edema and get that out of the way. To contrast that, arterial ulcers occur from lack of flow. So this is actually necrotic tissue or gangrenous tissue from lack of perfusion. Um, so it's almost like somebody put a little tourniquet on certain areas and um, the tissue just died. And we see this uh, specifically in patients who have um, a significant peripheral arterial disease, uh, smoking, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and um, it's more pronounced in patients who have diabetes because they tend to have significant vascular disease. You're going to find these most commonly um, on the toes, the feet, um, over any kind of what we call pressure points, although they're not true pressure ulcers, but any place where the capillary beds can be compressed can lead to arterial ulcers as well the lateral malleolus, and the tibia. Um, they tend to be deep and irregular, a very pale wound bed with necrotic tissue and minimal exudate because they're very dry because there's terribly poor perfusion. The uh, skin around it is usually very thin and shiny. There's no hair growth because hair can't grow because there's no nutrient or blood or oxygen getting to the skin. The skin itself is usually very pale and cool. Um, and when you elevate the leg, it gets worse. Uh, so with uh, venous disease, the, the cure is to elevate the leg. It makes it better. With arterial disease, when you elevate the leg, you actually um, decrease blood flow even further. So when the leg is dependent, it's oftentimes red or purple. And then when you elevate it, it becomes very pale and painful. The pulses on an arterial disease patient are oftentimes absent or weak. Uh, cap refill is going to be very delayed because of poor arterial flow, and you may even notice gangrene. So the goal for these guys is revascularization. Um, Antiplatelet medications to stop any clots from forming, and then management of risk factors that got us there in the first place. I have to tell you that these are very hard ulcers to heal because the body cannot supply the needed nutrients from the inside 
to get these wounds to heal. Um, diabetic ulcers we're going to talk about, but these tend to be um, neuropathic in origin. So there was a wound or an injury that they didn't realize. Um, and usually this is the plantar aspect of the foot, the tip of the toe, um, or lateral to the fifth metatarsal. And they're usually very, very deep with a surrounding callus. Uh, and the goal is just to offload um, and teach good foot protection and to have them come into the office uh, frequently for foot checks. Pressure injuries then, um, you may have heard of these referred to as pressure ulcers, decubitus ulcers, all sorts of things throughout your career, but the current terminology is a pressure injury. And this is due to decreased mobility um, and a prolonged pressure on a surface. Um, so it's like direct contact, bony prominence against the surface. Um, heel is very common as well as uh, sacrum, spine, scapula, occiput, elbows, um, ears, nose. They can get a medical device pressure injury, things like that as well. Um, so the, the skin is usually uh, atrophic. There's loss of muscle mass and the goal is to offload the pressure um, reduce the moisture, shear, and friction, and to supply adequate nutrition in the form of uh, fluid and protein in order to and nutrients in, in order to enhance healing. So really, for this unit, I really want you to focus on venous versus arterial um, because uh, we're talking mostly about vascular. But you need to be able to recognize the difference between lack of flow, which is arterial, versus lack of removal, which is venous. Just some uh, things to consider depending on the age of the patient. Pediatric patients, the lymph nodes are relatively large and often palpable, even though normal lymph nodes are usually not palpable. Um, lymph nodes are also very reactive in the pediatric patient, so even just a minor illness um, oftentimes results in uh, enlarged lymph nodes that will go down again. Uh, vaccinations also will oftentimes cause a temporary enlargement of lymph nodes. During pregnancy, vasodilation is very common. Um, the uterus uh, can obstruct venous return and lead to a supine hypotension. And then edema is also incredibly common during pregnancy. And all of this has to do with intra-abdominal pressures on the vena cava. Um, as the uh, older adult ages, arterial sclerosis is the um, hardening of arteries, and then atherosclerosis is the deposit of plaques within the vessels. So arterial sclerosis uh, decreases the ability of uh, blood flow alterations, uh, so the body can't um, dilate or supply additional blood flow as needed during activity. Uh, so that increases the risk of hypoperfusion to certain areas as needed. Uh, lymph tissue is um, kind of atrophies and becomes less effective. And then arterial insufficiency becomes more common, leading to problems like peripheral arterial disease.